with Paul Bay, CEO of Touchstone Exploration. My name is Ben Turney and I'll be hosting this evening's event. Paul will give us a presentation um, about the latest developments with Touchstone, um, after which Paul and I will have a conversation about the company, latest developments, and during this time we'll host um, questions from shareholders and participants in the call. In the bottom right hand side you'll see um, a chat window where you can type your messages which will go through to our moderator Stuart. Um, Stuart will then feed the questions through to us uh, for, Paul and, for Paul and I to, to discuss once he's given his presentation. So Paul over to you. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thanks Ben. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So should we start Paul with your presentation? Sure, that'd be great. Um, and I, I've really done this as a, a very abbreviated presentation. And then I thought what we could do is get into some more specifics. Uh, and Ben and I can answer some questions and have some discussions. So let me start out with a, a quick overview of why why invest in Touchstone. I think since we did our IPO back in uh, on June 26 of 2017, you know, the markets have certainly moved up and down and so is oil price. But what we've been able to show is pretty solid appreciation with about a, almost an 80% increase in our share price uh, since we did the AIM listing back in June. Um, it's, it's been higher than that at times, but in you know current markets, I still think that that's a very positive, certainly for a company our size. The second thing that I'll touch on today um, is really these world, what, what we call world-class exploration opportunities. And when we had them evaluated by our independent evaluators, um, you know, in a best case, they could add up to 16,000. Uh, BOEs per day, and, and the reason we use BOEs per day is that half of them are gas prospects and half of them are oil prospects. So we can talk about that a little bit of of how gas and oil differentiate on the island and the economics of that. Uh, the third part is, you know, we are well capitalized. I know there's a lot of sort of discussion out there that we're spending a lot of money on the drilling front right now. Um, we have sort of three different components that we can draw on. Uh, when we look at it, you know, we've got cash flow from operations on a day-to-day -day basis that we've got. Um, we've got uh, Crown Capital, who's our financial partner, our banker. Um, you know, they've, they've indicated to us all along that if we needed uh, more cash for development things, that they're certainly there to participate with us. And then the third thing is, is we, you know, we've got um, fairly large receivable in our, in our um, VAT refunds from the government. And so those come in on a pretty steady basis. So we kind of have those three things that we we look at, um, you know, funding our project. Uh, on the cash flow side, we are cash flow positive on every barrel that we produce. And um, you know, currently production sort of sits around that 1,800 barrel a day range. It's up and down over the mark, but that's actually a really good number when you think of. We exited the year last year at just north of 2,000, and we haven't drilled a single well in over a year. So it kind of shows you the decline. And what we can talk, Ben and I'll talk about that a little bit more about when we're going to get that program ramped up again. Um, the final point on there is that, you know, I think we've got a management team in place. I, I hope everybody's had an opportunity to, to meet us over the last couple of years. We've been pretty, pretty avid in, in getting to know everybody and our shareholders and, and obviously very open to uh, questions on an ongoing basis. Um, Trinidad itself, we really have two different projects in Trinidad. We've got a development project, which on the map that's up here is really the orange properties that overlay those large green identified oil pools. And then we've got a very large undeveloped exploration acreage. The main focus will be on the east side of the island on that Oratoa block. Uh, we'll talk about that. Um, we, we are the largest landowner on the island besides the Crown Corporation. Um, we, we have a very, very significant land holdings and probably now are the third or, third or fourth largest onshore producer. Uh, we've come a long ways from our 130 barrels a day that we that we started with. Just quickly talk about what I call our scalable economic growth program, which is really our development drilling program. Uh, we've got 19 onshore blocks, 10 of those are producing, and the teams identified 200 drilling locations. And when you think that we drill, call it 10 to 15 wells a year, you know that's up to about a 20-year drilling inventory. So it really gives us the opportunity to high grade the program, move to the areas that we have success in areas that have uh, excess capacity, um, you know, and lots of flexibility for us to move around. That program, again, as I say, we haven't drilled a well on this in almost a year now, but we will get back at that. And, and Ben and I will talk a little bit about what our plans are there. And then the second part, which um, is the exploration upside, which is our Oratoire block, that big yellow block on the east side of the island. 
we've identified four individual prospects. There's the Corazon Gas Prospect, which uh, was actually renamed Coho, um, and we really should start calling that Coho, so we'll, we'll make that change. Um, then the Cascadura Oil Prospect, which is a little, <clears throat> a little further to the east, and we actually spud that well on Friday of last week, and as of this morning, we're setting surface casing, so that one's moving ahead. And then we'll move directly to the south of there to a, 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 a different anomaly called Chinook, and we'll talk about that. Um, hopefully, depending on where oil prices go and how everything sort of checks out here, we, we'd like to go right from Cascadura down to Chinook. There might be a little delay of a month or so while we get the road done, but, but that would be the plan. And then uh, call it Q2 of next year, we'd like to move over to the Royston Gas Prospect, and, and it's, it's a monster prospect, and we can talk about that as we as we move forward here a little bit. Corazon's gas, um, we've already drilled that. It's drilled to TD, it's logged, and we'll be moving a service rig in there probably the week of the 21st of October, and I'll talk a little bit more detail about that one. Um, then on the, uh, the map here, um, what you can see is really the big block is the yellow, and then uh, the, the identified prospects that we have in here, they're actually quite low risk. In, in, when you when you when you look at the way we've done it, basically we're offsetting old wells that were drilled in the 1950s and 60s, and we think there's a bunch of bypass pay. Um, and obviously, with the first well we drilled here at Coho, now that we've seen the logs, very confident um, that we have a you know a very very thick gas column in there. You know, probably over 100 feet of uh, of gas pay uh, that we'll be testing. We're going to test it in a couple of intervals. There's actually a sand package that was not seen in the original well. That'll be our first test interval. And then we'll move up and test the, um, the uh, sort of the repeat of the, the well that was originally drilled in there. And that original well tested about eight, eight and a half million cubic feet a day. We've come up a little bit structure and we actually think the, the sand's a little bit improved. So we're, we're pretty hopeful for that as we move through into October and into <clears throat> early November when we'll have the results. Uh, Cascadura, well, the, where's, where the well is drilling right now, um, as I say, we set surface casing, so we should have that well TD by the end of the month. And again, as soon as we've got logs on that, we'll put out a press release on that. And then just to the south of that, you can see what we call Chinook 1, where we'll move directly south afterwards and drill a, a different anomaly that looks a lot like Cascadura. Um, but um, to be honest with you, I, I think it's got a little bit thicker pay. These wells were drilled in the 1950s. And then the final one that we'll move to will be the Royston one. And you can see it's quite a ways off to the east side of the island uh, and, and the block. So it takes a little bit longer to drill the, um, get the road built in there and, and get the rig moved over there. So probably Q1, or sorry, Q2 of next year. All in all, a very exciting program. Uh, one thing I haven't talked about, I'll just touch on quickly. If you look at that central block, which are those, it's called Carapel Ridge, Baraka and Baraka East, just south of our Coho star on there. Um, that, that particular pool is about a half a TCF of gas and 25 million barrels of liquids. So it gives you an idea of how big these prospects can be uh, as we go forward. So maybe Ben, with that sort of high level, I'll turn it back over to you to, uh, to do, um, to, to maybe we can get, entertain some questions and have a discussion. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. So let's start then talking a bit about Coho One, because I think that's um, where the market's uh, attention has really been recently. Now, you obviously um, were extremely confident about um, this well going into it. Um, you were talking about, you know, chance of commercial success of, I think, of around about 73%. What was it exactly that, that led you to be so confident um, going into that drill? So, Ben, that, that well, or that uh, uh, well is actually only a couple hundred uh, feet away from the original well that was drilled there in about 2001. As I say, it tested about 8 million cubic feet a day. We've got 3D seismic over it, which is that sort of color blob that you see around it on the map. And, and really, um, the reason we wanted to, to drill that well first, it's the smallest of all the prospects, but the reason that we wanted to drill it first is, is twofold. We wanted to prove that the geological model was there, that you could follow up these wells which we've obviously done now that we've seen the log. But the second thing is we wanted to make sure that we could drill the wells economic. Um, you know, we put in a $3 million cost on this well, and it looks like it's come in maybe a little bit under that, like 2.8 million. So the team did a really good job. It's, it's 8,500 feet in depth. Uh, it's been a long time since a well's been drilled to 8,500 feet onshore in Trinidad, uh, probably 25 years. 
Um, so that was the two reasons for doing it. The, the third reason, I guess, is it's also very close to the uh, to the shell plant that's located to the south of us. And if we have commercial success here, we can go down to that shell plant that has about 30 million a day of uh, processing capacity in it. And we've had some early discussions with them, but obviously we don't want to uh, uh, get too committed on that until until we get the test off the end of the month. So let's um, so, so let's talk a little bit about the um, about the testing. Um, now, obviously, you you've announced the discovery um, a couple of weeks ago, and you just told us that you're expecting the testing equipment to be on site, ready to commence on the 21st of October. Could you tell us a bit more about your test plan? Um, potential timelines and what your expectations are from this point forward. So as I mentioned, the first thing that we're going to do is we're actually going to test a, a lower sand that the team um, had identified before we drilled the well. And um, it, it's, it's, it's there. So what we want to do is test it first. Um, it'll probably take about a week. So, you know, should have those results by the, you know, the end of, let's say the 27th or 28th of October, somewhere in there. Um, if we get a good result on that, then then we'll obviously uh, uh, move up hole and, and test the upper zone. I guess we're going to move up hole either way. We'll suspend the lower test, and then we'll go up top and test the original uh, two sands that are up hole. We're going to test them together as one, uh, the up hole sands. And uh, we just think that you know that's how we would produce the well, so we might as well test it the same way that we're going to produce it. Uh, what are the expectations in here? You know, we've, we've said all the way along, and if we could get between a five and a 10 million a day uh, gas test off of this, that would be a huge success for us. Excellent. You know, to give you an idea man, on size of that, I mean, you're talking about something that's probably between 600 and 800 BOEs a day. I mean, it's a complete step change for us. And again, to reiterate, this is the smallest of all the prospects on the, uh, on the block. So obviously, um, we're, we're, we're trading in very difficult market conditions at the moment. Um, you know, liquidity is very tight. You know, we're, we're seeing share prices across the board in, in the small small caps are are struggling. Um, but so far, since since you announced obviously this result, um, the, and it's an actual discovery, we've actually seen touchstone share price has actually gone back a bit, which I, I do find a bit surprising given that, you know, we could be looking at a, a six to 800 BOE um, contribution to the company. What, what do you put that down to at the moment, Paul? I, I think it's a combination of things. I think number one, um, right now in the market, anytime you, you provide liquidity, um, I think that, you know, when there's somebody that wants to sell something, they'll sell into the liquidity. So I think we saw that. I mean, we saw volumes uh, move up quite dramatically for a few days after we made the announcement. So I think that's part of it. I think the other thing too is in, in fairness, and I think it's maybe prudent on the market's point of view is, you know, to, to talk about net pay in a well is, is interesting, but they, you know, I think the market really wants to see the, the test results and quite frankly, so do I. So I think, you know, I think from our point of view, um, we're in that show me stage. We are, you know, we're still fairly new to AIM. Uh, this is a new geological concept in Trinidad. And um, I, I think we're in a bit of a show me stage. So we just, you know, our view is we just want to be patient uh, do this right, get the good test results, and then we can go forward from there. So then in terms of, of then moving forward, now you, you already mentioned a little earlier on that um, part of the rationale for, for going for Coho One first, given it was one of the smaller targets you're going for, was to prove um, both the geological model and also that your team could deliver on budget. Um, to what extent would you say that the lessons that you've learned from this um, from this well can be applied to the the future um, drills in in the campaign at, on Ottawa? Yeah, so a couple of things we learned on the drilling front. Um, you know, we we still think we can shave some more days and times off of uh, off of how the well was drilled. Although that you know the, we we did it under budget, we still think there's some other ways that we can do that. Um, and I think the other thing that's maybe important is we were we were looking at maybe bringing in a different rig to drill. Uh, to drill Royston because it's quite a bit deeper. It's 10,500 feet. And uh, we're sort of looking now that we think we might be able to uh, use this existing uh, equipment to go over there. So that would be great. We could just keep the program rolling through the end of 2019 and into 2020. So I guess that's the exciting part of it. Uh, geologically, um, I guess the, uh, um, the, the positive was that we thought we could come up a little bit structure. We did. And uh, the second sand that we're going to test in this well, you know, that we thought it was worth going a little bit deeper to see if it was there. And the team got proven correct that it is there. And now we, you know, we still got to see if it's going to give up gas and commercial volumes or not. But that's that's uh, what we're looking at. 
Now, Paul, um, a question that I was um, asked by a, a shareholder in advance of this call was, <clears throat> if you're able to demonstrate that you have a commercial discovery at Coho One, um, is the company funded to be able to see that well through to commercial production? You've already mentioned the, the shell facility that's to the south that might be a potential consumer of any gas but we'll, we'll, what, what will the company how will the company finance development of, of this well assuming obviously that the testing um, um, you know gives rise to a commercial discovery yeah it, it's this is exactly the same answer I've, I've been given for about a year and a half and that is I do not mind borrowing money to build pipelines and tie uh, proven production into plants and I think that would be the avenue that you would see is we would just uh, we would just finance that to tie it into the facility. It's pretty simple. It's a, you know, it's a pretty simple uh, three and a half kilometer pipeline. Depending on what this test comes out at, will determine the size of the pipe we need. And then uh, and you know we know Shell wants the gas in their plants, so that's kind of where we're at. So um, if, if you were to give best guess, and I realize I'm probably putting you on the spot here a bit, but how, how long, um, assuming again that testing comes in in line with expectations, how uh, quickly do you think the company might be able to start generating revenue from this well? We're looking at, we think that we should be generating revenue by Q2 of next year. By Q2 of next year. Very good. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so um, in terms then of um, well, next steps, obviously um, we the company was waiting for the rig for Coho One, which it's moved straight on to Cascadura One. We've seen on the company's Twitter feed, um, we saw the preparation of the pad at, um, at Cascadura. Uh, what's the latest with Cascadura, please? As I mentioned, so we spotted it last Friday. Uh, we drilled to uh, surface casing, which is about 1,800 feet as of this morning. They were running in with uh, surface casing, should be on bottom, cementing over the next couple of days, and then we'll be drilling out the, uh, the next section of the hole, um, you know, I would say three or four days from now, and uh, should have, should be at TD end of the month. So um, one question, obviously, Paul, um, there's been no RNS of, about um, Cascadura One. Um, now, obviously, in the oil and gas exploration business, you know, a lot of a lot of your competitors, you know, they, they like to RNS as much as they can about these drills. Why why is the company elected not to release that information to the market uh, via an announcement? Well, I think what we decided early on, and and we we disclosed this in the in the releases we did early on, we would we would commence, we would put an RNS out when we started the program, which was Coho. And then we would give updates when we had information along the way. Um, you know, we look at this as a program. We don't look at this as individual wells. And so, you know, when we have the logs down on Cascadura, we will we will put another press release out on on what's there. When we have the test results from Coho, we'll put out those as individual releases. I I, I think what our point of view is that um, we'll put out press releases that have material information in them. Uh, what we don't want to do is be sounding promotional where we're putting out press releases when you spot a well. To us, that's not really material. Uh, the material things are, what are the test results? What do the logs look like? You know, when are you going to get this on production? How are you going to finance it? Those are the kind of things that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll put out there. It's, it's, you know, it's a balancing act, right, Ben? Um, and uh, I think we'd, we'd, uh, we're just trying to find that balance right now. Okay. So in terms of what you're actually hunting for at Cascadura, could you? Um, you've obviously obviously already said that um, Coho was the was the smallest of the targets. Where does where does Cascadura rank in your four what's now a four well program? So these are the two oil targets, Cascadura and Chinook, and and it's really interesting. At Cascadura, this well was actually drilled in 1958 and actually produced 27,000 barrels of oil um, out of the top 40 feet. So again, we know there's oil here. We know it's producible. What the team really wants to do is not only can we move up structure again on that initial well, but we also think there's additional pay in the upper horizon that they never perforated. And then there's a whole other sheet uh, below that that they actually drilled into, but they got stuck um, and were never able to uh, evaluate it. Uh, we actually think that that's a repeat of the upper sheet. So we're actually going to drill right through that as well. And we'll take this well down. To, it's a little shallower, actually. It's about 8,100 feet. And uh, then we'll have a full evaluation of the of the two zones. So, um, you know, to give you an idea of thicknesses here, these these you know these thicknesses could be up to about 400 feet. So, uh, you know, it's there's a there's a ton of oil in place here if um, if if we've got this got this right. So, from what you've described, I mean, would, would you would you rank this as a as an exploration well? Because it sounds like it's 
a, you know borderline of an appraisal well if this is you know well that's already produced twenty seven thousand barrels of, of oil yeah and, and even if you look at the engineering report that we had done sort of to to evaluate the the concept out here they actually gave us contingent resources for this well so um, our independent engineers actually said that you know in their view that this is more of a development well um, we are drilling it a little further away and we're moving up structure and all those kind of things but yeah it, it, it's a lower risk well and but to be honest with you we're not drilling this well to get a well that produces 27,000 barrels you know we're getting this to drill up a concept where hopefully there's another 10 or 11 development wells on that particular structure at Cascadura afterwards right um, mm. so that's why we look at it as more of an exploration play and we're going deeper right like, you know the deeper the deeper thrust sheets in here are the ones that I think everybody's really excited about. And have those um, have, have those um, thrust sheets been been drilled anywhere else on the island, or are there any analog analogous um, formations that, that have helped guide you in in this um, hypothesis? Yeah, so Carapel Ridge, Barak and Barak East, the big shell pool down to the southwest, that's mm -hmm. right on trend. It's the same formation. We're basically looking for exactly the same thing, but we've moved up structure into the oil window. Right, and that obviously, um, for everybody who's watching, you can see that on the map that's in front of us. So from the yeah. from those three structures to the southwest straight up to Cascadura 1. Yeah, and if you look at Balata East up to the uh, northeast there, that's, you know, that's done 10 million barrels of oil. That's also in the Herrera. It's quite a bit shallower up there, but, you know, you can see this is an oil, oil and gas fairway in here, so... Mm. So while we've been talking, Kieran's actually asked us a question, which I think you have already answered, but let's just let's just clarify that. So how long do you think Cascadura will take to drill, Paul? What's the target? So it, hopefully it's uh, drilled by the end of the month um, and then uh, and logged in case. So, you know, the first week of November is kind of setting up to be pretty exciting. We should have the Cascadura results and we should have the uh, Coho results as well. Perfect. Now, again, it's too early to say, obviously, to start talking about results. But if things do go to plan, um, what what is your what are your testing plans for Cascadura? When will you when will you aim to commence that, and how long will it take? Um, so the the plan would be we'd have to move the rig off the site, which takes a couple of weeks. Um, hopefully, Chinook One is ready, and then we can move directly to that site. Um, if we have to rack the rig somewhere, we may have to. To figure that logistically out but the idea would be to come over and uh and test that well you know i, I would hope within 45 days sort of prior to the end of the year i mean and that's a little bit a little bit selfish because what we'd love to do is uh perforate and get some results so we could book those reserves for our year-end reserve report awesome okay so you've, you've touched now on um chinook one now um i've obviously i've got I've, as we as we said in our preparation for this call I, I was quite surprised that Chinook one sort of suddenly snuck in there because um what, what I was aware of and what the market was aware of was that this was this was a, a three well campaign but you've actually now turned this into a four well campaign so do you want to just talk us through a bit about Chinook one a bit about its background and and, and why you're now targeting this this well next so you know originally what we kind of had done is we had broken this down into uh Coho, and then we had a prospect that we called West that was a couple of oil wells, um, and, and which are now called Cascadour and Chinook. The reason they've been pulled apart here is now that we've seen the seismic in here, it's very obvious these are completely different structures, um, entirely different structures. Um, so there really are two separate prospects. So, you know, Chinook one came along as we started to understand things a little bit more. And then we got the logs of a well that was drilled there. It was actually called BW7, and then they sidetracked it over to what they called BW7X. Again, they got stuck in the hole, and they were never able to test it. But we really like what we see on logs, and we also like the fact that while they were drilling those wells, they actually had uh, free oil. They actually cored one of the wells that had oil in the core. Um, so, you know, I think it had all the indications. So, again, it's a little higher risk because you don't have, you know, you didn't produce 27,000 barrels a day out of it, um, all of those good things. But it's, again, got the double sheets, uh, double thrusts on it. Um, it's on the other side of the river. That's why we've got to build a bridge over the river there to get there. So I guess over time it's evolved a little bit, Ben, um, and maybe we should have been a little clearer that we were going we to move there. But uh, it's, um, it's as exciting as Cascadur. It's probably... You know, the thicknesses on the logs look a little thicker than Cascadura. So we're kind of going from smallest to next biggest to bigger, and then the biggest gas plate being central. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, just uh, before we move on to that, let, let's just stick with um, Chinook for, for a moment. So um, obviously, so there isn't a huge amount of information out there about what you're searching for. Now, you've obviously um, told us that it will be the same rig that was used for Coho and is currently being used for Cascadura. So can we assume that you're going for a, a similar target depth, similar type discovery? What, what are you looking for there? Yeah, it's exactly the same thing, and it's exactly the same. It's, it's still Herrera. We're still... Um, Still looking at it as a turbidite deposit. Um, you know, it, it, it's just in the oil window. That's why it's a green star versus a red star. So, and in terms of very, in terms of in terms of budgeting for this well, um, is is the company fund funded for for Chinook one as well? Well, uh, you know, I think uh, one of the questions I see on the right hand side is, are we still cash flow positive? The answer is yes, we are. I mean, we did like three point six million of cash flow in the first half of the year, so. The idea being here is if this well kind of drags into November, December, that, you know, the second half of the year cash flow, um, have to go back and talk to Scott and the board and make sure that, that we're okay on it. But, you know, that would be our plan would be to, uh, to move right to Chinook and drill it. So, uh, I mean, oil price has been moving around quite a bit here in the last little while, but uh, anywhere around that $60 rent range, I think we're good to go. So that actually does bring us on to one of the questions that was asked on the um, by one of the viewers um, who asked us um, whether you've actually managed to hedge any production and to what extent does the do, do the do the uh, fluctuations in in the Brent price affect you for for planning purposes for this well for this drill campaign? So whenever we're planning, we always use the strip price. So you know our budgets basically run on basically where we are today. We did hedge eight hundred barrels a day at about fifty six dollars. Um, as a floor price through till the end of December, um, just to protect our capital program. We obviously haven't got there yet. Um, so, you know, we're, we're comfortable with the program that we've got from now till the end of the year. And we try to hedge, Scott ideally would like to hedge about a third of the production on a rolling basis whenever we can. And as I say, we do it just with a put. So I think it cost us 180,000 US uh, to buy the put uh, for, the, for the 2019 calendar year. Right, and uh, Jason, who's um, who's listening in, is as surprised as I am that you've um, just told us you're going to be building a bridge to get to Chinook. How much does that cost out of interest? Well, you know, a lot of it's just manpower, right? It's, uh, you know, we're, we're not talking millions of dollars here, and, and the bridge isn't, uh, you know, we're not building something across the Thames here. This is a, you know, a creek when it's not raining and a fairly wide creek after after it does rain. So we've got to build for sort of the high watermark. But, you know, the overall costs to get in here are in the order of... Uh, Three hundred and eighty thousand US, so they're not they're not big numbers, right? Okay, and then so I mean, assuming then you do make a, a discovery. Um, obviously, one of the appeals for Coho One is the fact that it's so close to existing infrastructure and therefore close to market. Um, how does how does that um, or in terms of if you make a commercial discovery at Cascadura One and a Chinook One, how much local infrastructure is is already in place to support a, a discovery? Well, I, you know, I think initially the, the nice thing about Cascadur and Chinook is you go and you, you perforate and hopefully the well will, uh, will flow on you. All you got to do is put it in tanks and then we truck it from there to a sales point, right? So, right. you know, you, you get cash flow out of it pretty quickly. If the prizes are as big as we think they are, um, you basically truck it while you build pipelines. And there's a pipeline connection down at Cats Hill just to the south there. You see that 30 million barrel pool to the south. So we could just Green. pipeline down. And, and tie in there. So uh, there are a bunch of options uh, in there. Okay. So let's um, let's move then on to um, your plans for the central block and specifically Royston One. Now, um, you've you've described this as a monster, a monster target that you're going for. Um, you've released to the public information that um, this is a much deeper target, and uh, you've previously said that you would therefore need uh, a much bigger drill rig to be able to to um, drill this well. Uh, what's the latest status with that, Paul? So yeah, it, you know we've talked about this. This is this is actually what I would say is the closest look-alike to Carapel Ridge um, when we look at it on logs. Um, you know, it looks like the Carapel Ridge logs to us. You know, it's a uh, it's a well-defined uh, gas structure. The well was drilled back in the '60s by Shell. It was never tested. Um, the way they drilled it. Uh, because they were being very cautious, wanted to make sure they didn't take any gas kicks, so they used a very heavy mud. And as a result of that, we think that's why they didn't see any gas while they were drilling it. Um, it was also, you know, 50 years prior to Carapel Ridge, so 
they really didn't know what they were, you know, what they were looking for. So, you know, we look at the old logs. Uh, we look at Carapel Ridge now. Um, could it be the same size as Carapel Ridge? I, 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 I guess it, it, it could be, and that would certainly be, um, that would certainly be very exciting for us. But, uh, you know, it, as I say again, we're drilling offsetting uh, an existing well, and we'll just rework the old logs in what we've done. Now, originally, this well's 10.5, uh, 10,500 feet. So about 2,000 feet deeper than the other wells that we've drilled so far. And the question was, is could the rig, uh, would we have to find another rig to drill to that depth? And originally, we thought we probably would have to. What we're finding now is that with the rig that we have, uh, there is a really good possibility we might be able to um, uh, use smaller drill string in the bottom part of the hole. And if it's a gas well anyway, it doesn't really matter. And we could drill down to the 10.5 and evaluate. Now, if we're right on this prospect, the prospect is actually quite a bit deeper than that. Um, but really what we want to do is we just need to drill far enough into it. And at 10.5, you drill like 1,000 feet into the reservoir. Um, you know, if that's gas charged, uh, that's, that's, you know, fantastic. And we could always wait. And then for development wells, we could bring in a larger rig to, uh, to, to see sort of more delineation on it. Um, so that's our that's our thinking right now. We really there is a huge advantage to keep this program moving along as a continuous program. So that's what we want to do if we can. And it's, and in terms of funding for the program, um, are, are you funded for Royston? Well, you know that wouldn't be till Q two or Q you know Q two of next year. So again, you got the same thing going on where you've got cash flow uh, coming in over that period of time from our existing production and and go from there. And Quite frankly, again, if we're in that that same position, you know, if, if in a perfect world, if you had, you know, either Cascadour or, or Chinook come along with what we've already seen at Coho, you start to, you know, generate some pretty serious cash flow into 2020, right? Exactly. Understood. So um, in terms of um, what to look out for as we move into 2020, um, we talked, you talked a little bit earlier in the presentation that you, you might um, initiate again um, more drilling on your existing producing assets. What, what, what are your plans for next year beyond obviously Chinook and, um, and Royston? So, you know, we've got the exploration program, right? So, you've, you know, we've kind of outlined those, those particular ones. I, I should mention on that, on that, I'll just go back there, sorry to jump around here on you, Ben. Um, when we applied for what's called the Certificate Environmental Compliance, we actually comp applied for multiple wells off of the same pad. So I think in total there's 14 wells approved um, on the uh, on the Ortoa block. So one of the things that we could do, you know, if, if we wanted to, if let's say we get a really great well at Cascadura, while we're waiting to get the road built over to, um, to Royston, you could go in and drill a follow-up well at Cascadura or Chinook if you wanted to. Coho, I don't think you will. I think the, the straw we've got into that pool, um, you know, we should be able to drain that pool um, pretty effectively with what we've got. So, you know, that's that's how that program rolls along. And then when you were asking me about the development side of things, uh, that, those are those orange blocks. And the reason we stopped the program or, or put it on hold for a little while was um, the the company, here, uh, which used to be called Petrotrin, the Crown Corporation, went through a restructuring and rolled into a, a, a new Crown Corporation called Heritage. And what Heritage wanted to do was sit down with us and get a long-term plan for how they were going to develop all these fields. So what we've been working with very closely with Heritage over the last year is sort of a longer-term uh, concept of how you would develop these, you know, right from drilling to completions to potential EORs to CO2 floods to, you know, uh, water floods to everything as we move along. So. You know, and, and what we're going to hopefully end up with is a new agreement uh, or a new understanding or a new agreement uh, that'll have this much longer term view on how we develop these properties, which benefits them, but obviously is a huge benefit to us going forward. So um, so that's the process that we've been, been in. And I think, you know, in fairness, I, they've gone through a lot of changes, a lot of personnel changes as well. Um, so we've been working closely with them. But I, I think it's going to be a great thing for for Trinidad and for Touchstone. And it'll be all the operators, quite frankly, in Trinidad, if it's successful, that'll benefit from the new philosophy of heritage uh, going forward. Yeah, so I mean, just while so while we're talking about the, the operating environment, we've, we've actually 
fielded a few questions um, about uh, some of the changes that have been in Trinidad. Now, um, I know that yesterday the government in Trinidad and Tobago, they published their budget. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and your response to that and, and to what extent it will affect Touchstone moving forward? So the budget was put out yesterday. It, it, you know, it, um, it, it really two things it did. There's a, there's a tax called the Supplemental Petroleum Tax. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tax that kicks into effect above $50. And it's an 8%, 18% tax. Um, what they did is they increased the deductibility on the SPT. We used to be able to deduct 20% of our capital costs against payable SPT. They increased that to 25%, which is great. It's not really a big material move, but I mean, it is great that that moved up. And then on the other side, what they did is they, uh, they basically um, increased um, the, the corporate tax, if you want to call that, accelerated um, how quickly we will chew through our uh, our pools. From our point of view, it doesn't have a huge effect on us in that we've got very large pools. Uh, Scott ran it this morning with Kale, and, and basically it's about a 1% or 2% change to our, our net present value. So very, very little change in, in that point of view. They, they also did some tweaking with you can no longer deduct 100% of your um, of your pools that you carry forward. You can only use 75% of them, and the other 25 have to be expenses within a given year. So, you know, because we've got pools and because we're an active operator, it doesn't have as much effect on you. But if you were in a pure harvest mode, um, I think it would have a pretty significant effect on you. So, so, um, so just sort of looking at another detail in relation to that, we, we were asked earlier on by Ted, who <clears throat> asked us about uh, the reduction in the loss release loss relief rate from 100% to 75% of taxable profit from the 1st of January. Um, I appreciate that's a bit of a technical question, but is that, is that um, something you can give us some detail on at this point, or, or will we have to wait for that to see how it might affect the company? No, that's exactly what I was just talking about, where we used to be able to deduct 100% of our, our our loss carried forwards against income in a given year, and now we can only now you can only deduct seventy five percent of them. Uh, the advantage that we have right now is we're you know we're spending more capital than we're actually generating, so we're actually building pools, so we have some protection against that. So it's you know it's it's a really valid question. It's going to uh, it, it'll affect each different producer differently, um, but because of the size of our pools, it it uh, you know we're able to mitigate that. It, it will catch up with you at some point. I mean, let, let's you know, not sugarcoated here either. I, I don't think it was a very positive thing that they did. I think they, you know, the trade-off between giving us additional deduction on the SPT and then trying to accelerate uh, collectability of the uh, corporate tax um, is, you know, net-net, as Scott points out, is really on a NPV basis, uh, doesn't affect us. So, so, so following on from that, um, Pierce um, also asked us, he, he pointed out some issues he believes in terms of how friendly the, the government in Trinidad and Tobago is towards oil and gas companies. Um, to what extent um, do you see them as a, as a helpful partner in what you're doing or, or, or are they, do, do they make the, the operating environment more difficult as, as Pierce suggests in his comment? I think there's two, there's two parts to this question. From an operating environment point of view, it's actually a great place to operate. Like, from being able to get permits, uh, get approvals, um, you know, get things done in the field. Is there equipment there? Are the people there? You know, can you operate? Yeah, I, I, it's a great place to operate, to be honest with you. Um, and, and great knowledge, like they've, you know, they've had a hundred years of building up universities that are training engineers and geologists locally. You know, that's why 100% of our staff down there is all local. It's, you know, the knowledge base is incredible. Um, that's the operational side. On the fiscal side, you know, I, I guess I was a little disappointed in the budget. I think there's a lot more they could have done uh, yesterday to uh, to encourage additional exploration and production on the island. And, um, you know, government always has to balance between the revenue and, you, you know, what they get for get from the producers. And But they, they really need to get in a mode, a little bit more of a mode of uh, give the incentive and, and let the producers increase the production on the island. So, uh, I, I guess, as I say, I was a little disappointed, but the one thing that they don't do, which we've seen in a lot of other jurisdictions, is really change the rules. You know, they tweak these things a little bit and try to keep a level playing field. You know, we've in the seven years that we've been doing this in Trinidad, we've never seen like huge major changes that are, you know, really affect you adversely. So I, that's the positive.
So in terms of encouraging um, more exploration, we, we've got the, the map in front of us, which shows uh, your land position. Now, right in the center of that map, we can see East Brighton. Now, this is um, a project area that the company hasn't talked too much about. Um, do you want to tell us just a bit there about well, what's at East Brighton and, and what the long term potential might be? I can give you a really short answer on this one, Ben. Um, it came along as part of an acquisition that we did onshore. It's, it actually sits offshore, and we will be doing nothing on East Brighton going forward. And there's nothing. Oh, okay, so production area. simple as that. Yeah. Okay, so we obviously need to take that one off the map. Okay, that shoots me down quite easily there. <laughs> Moving on. Okay. So it's the right thing to do so to show you all the land, but it's it's not a prospect. Got you. Understood. Okay, so we have um, we've had quite a few questions um, about the company's funding. I think that reflects the the move in the market at the moment you know but these are quite uh, nervous times um so should we, we've obviously we, we've been over this um, um during the the call and you, you talked about it in the presentation but let's just go back to the to the three pillars of of the company's finance which earlier you described as the the cash position and its cash generative position um the vat refund and, and its access to um, capital markets via borrowing facilities let's um let's just let's just re recap a little bit on that paul so we were north of seven million uh, of cash at the end of you know at the, at the last end of the quarter. So it gives you an idea. I mean, we drilled the last well for two point eight million. So kind of gives you an idea where we're at on that. You know, we did three point six million of cash flow in the first half of the year. Um, you know, it's not like we're drilling ten million dollar wells here. You know, these are these are you know wells that we can manage in that three million dollar range. And then on the uh, on the debt side, and and again, it's consistent with what I've said all the way along. As an organization, we don't mind borrowing money against development, uh, you know, testing wells, tying them in, doing all of that kind of stuff. Um, but we want to make sure that any of the exploration drilling that we're doing is funded through cash flow and 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 generated on that side. You know, the the VAT issue. I know Ben, you and I've talked about it, and it, it it's a pretty significant on the balance sheet. But the problem with the VAT issue is we never know when it's coming in. Like it's up to the government; it kind of gets refunded when we want. So Scott really never counts on that. Um, he always, you know, he wants to focus directly on cash flow, cash on hand, and, and the available uh, credit facility that we have. So for so. those, um, for those, for those people who are listening in who haven't necessarily taken a look at the balance sheet, I'm definitely appreciate what you're saying about you know there's no way of being able to predict when the VAT might come in. But just just remind us what how much is the VAT worth? The VAT refund. It was just over five million US at the last quarter, right? So it's a pretty significant number. Yeah, absolutely. So, and you know, it's, it's, that, that, that it was... is a significant number. And, and the, the minister actually dealt with it in the budget last night and suggested that he's going to try to figure out some ways to, to accelerate that payback on it. So exactly. So, I mean, that, that sort of as, as you move into 2020, which we've, we've, you know, we can see a question from Hamza here asking if TXP is, is fully funded for its 2020 exploration program. You know, that, that does sound like it'd be quite a useful fill up to the, to the company's coffers sort of ahead of uh, further exploration next year yeah I just don't know uh, I just don't like there's no way to count on it right Ben so we've got to be careful you know the nice thing too about this program that we have right now is we can we can manage it right like we're not we didn't make a four well commitment to the rig here so if we've got to pull things in and out and move them around and you know push them out by a quarter or something like that we can do that to fund the program so um, it looks like uh, the the line broke up a bit, Paul. When you told us the VAT figure, we got a couple of people asking us um, how much was that? How much is that figure? So if you wouldn't mind just repeating that, please. It was just north of five million dollars US at the end of last quarter. Excellent. So five million dollars um, at the end of last quarter. Right. So we've got a question here from um, Rob Malloy. Um, he's asking, at what oil price does Touchstone break even? Now I realise that's a bit of a that can be a bit of a difficult question to answer. But is that are you able to give us sort of any 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 colour to that? Yeah, I know there's so many different ways that people calculate it. Right? They look at our field level net backs. They look at you know all in everything. And uh, my my best answer to you is that there's also a big change at fifty dollars. Like. When you go below fifty dollars, the royalty drops and your your SPT goes away, and there's a bunch of things. There's actually you're actually more profitable at forty nine ninety nine than you are at fifty six or fifty seven dollars. So it kind of moves around a little bit um, uh, when we're dealing with Trinidad. But you know, if you look at our operating costs now, they run about fifteen dollars a barrel, and you look at uh, royalties in the SPT on top of that. So you know, our field level netbacks are about twenty eight or twenty nine dollars a barrel. So 
you know, I guess you could argue um, that that's probably our break even when I compare it to how our competitors uh, compare that break even. So um, then in terms of um, the actual market dynamics, um, one of the points I made earlier on was that, you know, we've obviously seen the share price go backwards since you announced the Coho One discovery. Um, and, you know, by all accounts, it seems you, you feel very confident about <clears throat> the, the, the forthcoming testing. Um, we've obviously, you know, we talked a bit about market conditions, uh, but we've, we've had a question from Lassie who's asked, um, why hasn't uh, management taken the opportunity to, to buy more shares at this point? Well, and, you know, it's a, it's a good question. I think if, if you look at every month we buy additional stock um, and we buy it through a, a, what we call a, basically an ESOP program. Um, and the reason we do it that way is nobody can ever sort of blame us for either buying it on the lows or the highs. And quite frankly, 90% of the time we're blacked out um, with information that we have or, or could be deemed to having. So, you know, I think that's probably the answer to the question, but Scott, uh, James and myself, um, you know, all fully, all fully participated in that program and, and the directors also uh, significantly participate in that program once a year. So, you know, I think it's, it, we've been buying it, you know, I've been buying it for three years now. Yeah, and that's obviously, that's all, that's all recorded in the RNS announcements that have come out. So, Cheryl yeah. just can easily say that. We put one out, you know, I, I say we don't want to put out too many RNSs, but we have to put one out at the beginning of every month after James Scott and I buy our stock, right? Exactly, exactly. So we had a question a bit earlier on from Dave who asked about the water disposal well and um, what savings, um, that's what operational savings that, that's made to the company. Um, can you can you talk to us a bit about that, please? Yeah, the water disposal well actually hasn't made any savings. It actually costs us money because we truck some water into that, to that well. It was purely a... Uh, I'll call it a corporate responsibility um, decision that we made that we just don't think putting produced fluid that includes uh, salt water and, and some chemicals that we use back into the environment at the surface is the right thing to do. So we're putting it back into the reservoir. The advantage is we're also repressuring the reservoir, right? As you, as you put more uh, water in, you increase the pressure and should, we should see some recovery in the offsetting wells, although to be honest with you, we have not seen that yet. So. Um, you know, we're, we're talking pennies a barrel here. We're not talking dollars a barrel, but but it's still uh, it's still the right thing to do. Excellent. So I think Paul, um, we're drawing to an end now. Um, we've we've asked all the questions that people have asked us so far. You know, we're, we're just over forty five minutes in. So to to sum up, um, we've obviously talked a bit about the news flow that's coming up. We're expecting Coho One um, test results towards the end of this month. Um, we're expecting target depth for Cascadura to follow shortly after. Um, can you tell us what else um, shareholders might expect from the company over the coming months in terms of news flow? Um, well, I th I, I, I'm really hopeful that we can strike a new deal with Heritage on the development side and then we can kick that program off again as well. Uh, you know, those wells, when we look at the rate of return and the success rate that we've had on those, those are great. So we're, you know, that's obviously something that we, we want to press release as we go forward. Um, and then, uh, you know, we'll release our third quarter numbers on November the 13th. Um, so those will be out as well. So that's, I would say that's probably going to be the news flow. And it'll be very timely just in case anybody has any concerns. As soon as we have, you know, good test results, um, once we're done the program at Coho, we'll put those out and and we'll uh, we'll put Cascadura out as soon as we've got the logs. So excellent. Well, Paul, thank you very much for your time this evening. And um, we gave just an opportunity there if there were any more questions to come through, and, and none more have. Um, so as ever, thanks for your your candid answers, and uh, we look forward to speaking to you again in the coming months. And good luck with the results. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. appreciate everybody. Uh, um, obviously listening in and if we've, we've also got an information on the uh, on our web page so if you have any direct questions please don't hesitate to send them to that as well fantastic brilliant well thank you very much everybody for for joining us this evening this uh, will bring this to an end now uh, we'll publish this tomorrow morning on the website uh, and with some follow-up um, coverage as well okay Paul thank you very much <laughs>